In 1776, the year the Declaration of Independence was signed, one of every six Americans was of African-American ancestry. 99% of them were slaves. James Fortin was one of about 200 free blacks living in Philadelphia. At 14 years old in 1780, his free life came down to a game of marbles. I'm Jake Storielli, and this is Laughs from the Past. All right. Nice intro, a little mouth trumpet, flute. A little mouth trumpet. Trombone. I, think I should I should have kept the first one short. But I can edit it. I'll edit I it. I was rolling. No, now we got to leave it in. All right. Welcome to season four of Last from the Past, Children in History. Kids making history. Last week we did the Newsboys of 1899. We're going 200 years into the past. Crazy when you think about like how much l- history there is. 200 years before the Newsboys, which was 100 years ago. Which was 100 years ago, and then 200 years before that, and then before that there was other history. It's crazy, man. History's always happening. Whoa. 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 My name is Jimmy. I was a history major. I have my friend Jake here, co-host. He was not a history major. He's learning about this stuff for the first time. I think, though, like you've accrued a lot of general history knowledge. I mean, this is 22 plus 15 is 37 plus 10, 40. We're coming up on 50 episodes, I believe, Jake, of knowledge you've accrued. Scary stuff, Shane. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not. Um, it's not really impressive history knowledge i'd say it's kind of like there's there's been a couple times i've had a fun fun fact slash anecdote to add yeah well you know that in 17, 1776 the revolutionary war began were you about to say seven minutes in heaven no that's what I, it sounded no i like. know i've never i'm not allowed to say those words anymore oh, oh wow since yeah. the uh that's right okay yeah, yeah. So, this is about James Fortin. James Fortin. We're going into uh, the Revolutionary War and Navy, uh, slavery, which is always a uh, hor- horrifying subject to talk about. We're going into, uh, you know, British versus America, free man versus non free man. And, and it's all centered around 14 year old James Fortin. Fortin. Oh, I hope I'm saying the last name right. Fortin? I think it's Fortin. F-O-R-T-E-N. Yeah. Fortin? Yeah. Fortin. You want to dive right in? I think so. Um, Well, we could do do a little precursor. Um, Yeah. You know, we're we're big behind the the curtains, guys. Um, Sounds like a nuts story. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Sounds like intense. I can't even... I, this isn't even like lame white guy cop out. Like there's no part of me that can imagine being one of 200 free people in a city in a town, in a time, in a country where anyone who was quote unquote like you was not free at a 99% clip. Yeah. That's insane. My question is, is like, okay, so 99% of people who had the same skin tone as this guy were slaves. What stops the general public from seeing him walking the streets? Right. Like, I feel like, and this is terrible, but I mean, just a numbers game, it feels like 
he would have to have his card of freedom or whatever it was like out at all times. Otherwise, it was just like I don't know how it how I don't know how it worked. And even if it was, which I I don't know, maybe maybe we'll find out. I don't I don't think we will. But even if it was, like people are bad nowadays. Like back then, yeah. Like what's stopping one mean drunk from like cornering him, taking it, and like game over? Like that's I I don't like I don't get it. Yeah, I don't get it either. But I don't know how the rest of society. Like I don't know if it was it still ought to be a miserable life of sorts because you even though you're free, you can't just walk around and do what everyone else is doing. Like that wasn't even allowed up until like 1950 in America. Yeah, we're talking about. 1780. So I I don't I don't understand that at all. There's probably dissertations and theses and all this written on it that uh, have the information of like how it worked, but we'll get into that another time. Let's just start reading from this book I have. Whenever an American privateer captured a British ship, practically everyone in Philadelphia lined the docks along the Delaware River to cheer the American sailors as they led the defeat vessel into harbor. Kind of like a walk of shame for the British. Right. Like you just get taken in and everyone's cheering about how you got captured and you feel like dumbs. Hey, good job, buddy. Yeah, nice try. Nice try. Can't outrun our American ships. So the crowd then surged to the London Coffee House where the ship's cargo was auctioned off and the proceeds divided among among the American crew. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Kind of like Vikings time. Like, yo, we captured a ship. Let's see what they got. And then you're just like, <laughs> this guy had a nice bracelet. Who wants this nice bracelet? Two buckets of corn. No rules is kind of fun during the good times. I want. I would love to see. Like there was someone who was probably. I mean, I'm again. My a lot of my 1700s knowledge is probably from bad movies that didn't depict anything properly. But I'm picturing this boat coming to shore. Some town hooligan who somehow gets dubbed this guy is at the top of the boat and doing exactly what you said. Bracelet. Who needs a bracelet? (laughs) Billy Sue. Bracelet for you. And it's just like. I <laughs> that's what I picture, and I think that was kind of what happened. It's cool, like in in like no no lines of communication at all. You just had to listen for the hullabaloo. Like if you heard people cheering, that meant oh, we got a British ship. Let's all go to the coffee house. They're gonna be auctioning off shit. Like you you oversleep, you could miss out on such an exciting day. You're done. Yeah, you could miss the best day ever. Yeah, it's crazy. I would love to see a list. I'm sure these exist in history somewhere where you can find a list of the items that were auctioned. Oh, okay. I'd be so interested to find out, you know, the men's shoes. Some Dude, that's how, that's how you become the town Larry Gurgich. Like, if you sleep through one of those events, yeah. like, oh, Jack Horner, you, you're going to sleep through another one like you did when we when the pirate ship came in? Yeah. And then everyone starts laughing in a hearty belly laugh. They just start, they put all their goods on the table. And you got nothing, sleepyhead. Nothing. Uh, For you, why don't you take, why don't you get some more rest, Jack Horner? (laughs) Another day of rest. (laughs) Doesn't cost you a thing, so that's good. I'd love to see a list of what's on there. Like, was it clothing? Was it food and goods? Like, was there gold? I have no idea. It could be. It could be so. Uh, no idea. Ecliptic, the list. I mean, if these are war, this was like a warship, right? Yeah. So I, well, I doubt there was like gold, right? Well, no. It could have been. It could have been supplies for like the army. Could have right, been anything. But did they still need like gold? Uh, well, there. The next line I just read it. Okay. Says that sometimes there was gold aboard. I'm guessing cool. you need to pay the soldiers. You need to pay for stuff. You know. So. Yeah. All right. When there was gold aboard, even boys, powder monkeys, and cabin boys had pockets sagging with heavy coins. Like many boys in Philadelphia, James Fortin wanted to sail aboard a privateer more than anything in the world. 
I get that. Yeah, you see, they're heroes. Like every time they bring a ship in, the they're the town heroes. They captured the enemy. It's also the coolest form of transportation at the time by far. Well, it's that or walking. Right. <laughs> yeah. Horse and buggy. It's, it's a blowout to be yeah. on a giant boat. Yeah, that's like... That's how we would like picture... I don't even know. We take all forms of transportation. For yeah, planning. it would it would be like if you're into if you're like a speed junkie or into planes and stuff. It would be like a fighter pilot being like, "You want to come for a ride?" Yeah, yeah. Not everybody gets to go on a big, big ship, right? That's a privilege. So, it wasn't just the money for James though. James wanted to fight for American freedom. He believed the American cause offered a better chance for his people than that of the British, who ran an enormous slave empire in the West Indies. This might be an American textbook because, I mean, anytime someone tries to put you know, more blame on the British and the, Ameri- and the slave right. trade, like, yeah. Who's, uh, who's writing the book? Americans wrote this book, I'm going to guess. Yeah. So, James was a patriot. He did like America from like other things I've read, but let's not act like the British were much worse. Like right. everyone was involved in this deal. Right. But uh so James owed his freedom to his grandfather, an African-born slave who had somehow scraped together enough money to buy freedom for himself for himself and his wife. All their children, including James's father, had been born free. James had even been lucky enough to go to a school run by a Quaker teacher that opposed slavery. James knew the sweetness of freedom, and he wanted it for everyone. I mean, that's that's very endearing in like a nice way. But I have so many questions that I don't think we can answer right now. Like, if if people, this is where it gets weird because I was gonna say if people were so bad that they just like institutionalized slavery right that was part of their world and they did it but then they what would make that person allow a slave to buy their freedom that that confuses me like couldn't they just say nope and steal their money the fact that someone allowed it to happen but then we did do like in the civil war we talked about how like andrew jackson had slaves but he was opposed of Slavery, basically, and like, but he had him, but he treated his nice, but like, he, it's such a weird paradox. Like, it's terrible, but why would you would? Ex- what I'm having trouble with, I would expect all people that had slaves to be evil, evil, terrible people, right? And I would expect those people to not allow a slave to buy their freedom. Yeah, I don't. I mean, there's not a good comparison. Any any comparison, you end up sounding bad. But I think it was just kind of like, this is how things worked. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Because it's weird. Like, all right. But anyway, so then once you have your freedom, your your kids are born free. Like that was big, big move by James's grandpa, grandpa, grandpa. Um, yeah, that's kind of like the, uh, it's, it's like your brother Luke, Australian. What, uh, that he was born in Australia? Yeah, if you're, if they're free, you're born free. Yeah. If you're born in Australia, you're Australian. Yeah. You're, yeah. But like, James's grandfather at the time, he was just buying freedom for himself and his wife. And then, in turn, by having children, you actually bought the freedom for like, yeah, down the line. How many generations? Pe- yeah, yeah, like how many people did he buy that freedom for? That's kind of crazy. If you were to like, I'm picturing if this was a documentary and they just put the family tree, like to nowadays, and like, yeah, James bought freedom, or till slavery ended, how many people fall on that tree until the end of the Civil War that didn't. That it's nuts. I mean, that's why people like love and are interested in doing that heritage stuff. Like that's imagine the powerful moment of like seeing a picture of that man that <laughs> freed 
your whole everyone you've ever known in your family yeah. 200 years ago that is insane that is really cool that's like really powerful to think about all right yeah so at first james's mother was dead set against going to sea james's father had died and james was her only son she needed him but he had a powerful argument the family was living in rags without even enough money for new shoes he reminded his mother that a privateer's wages which was four dollars a month could make ends meet for the family even if there wasn't any prize money. And if there was, they could breathe much easier. When she nodded her head, James was in heaven. So he's like, Ma, we're poor. So I can get us money. Yeah. Seems like a sound argument. I'm with it. But it's kind of crazy from there, like, yo, we have our freedom, James. Like, why would you go risk it and go to war? <laughs> and he yeah. goes, that's why we have our freedom. Yeah, that's, right. uh, that's patriotic stuff right there. He signed on as a powder monkey for the Royal Lewis, the best-known privateer in Philadelphia. It had been built by the Pennsylvania Commonwealth to protect American vessels from British warships that threatened their harbor. Captained by Stephen de Couture, the Royal Lewis captured more British ships than any other privateer, and the crew earned more prizes. Best of all, the crew was racially integrated. James would be one of 20 Negroes on board. That's crazy to think there, there was only 1% of the population that was free, and then there's 20 on this ship. Well, that's what I was going to get to because I, I was going to, as you know, I, I link things back to sports. And again, we go back 50 years and there's signs of um, insane racism that I was like, wow. I mean, I wonder, like, what was this kind of battalion like? Was there like three or four good guys that had to constantly defend them or were they all generally kind of good to each other because like lives were on the line like it wasn't sports <laughs> like it it wasn't necessarily like <laughs> a, you know a baseball game where there was some racism it wasn't like well at the end of the day I'm gonna go home and get dinner it's like we're fighting for our lives there so I was kind of wondering that but yeah I guess that uh having having that mix was probably a good thing yeah I mean, there's no, like, we need to galvanize the troops. Like, your life or death, you better be galvanized. You better all get along. So, anyway, James's job was to uh, keep the cannons on deck supplied with gunpowder. This is where this I got really interested reading this, Jake. The gunpowder was stored below deck in a dry room called the magazine. Powder monkeys had to be fast, brave, and cool in battle. Usually they were small, but James was nearly six feet tall. 14-year-olds, he was six feet tall. Get out of here, James. Yeah. I was Team James until that, but, like, come on. Can't be tall on me. Yeah, what the hell. But if it didn't bother Captain Decatur, it didn't bother James. James' courage was tested on his very first voyage when the Royal Lewis met the British ship active and quickly traded cannon shots. James tucked bags of flammable gun flour inside his jacket to shield it from flying sparks and sprinted up and down stairs as the ship rocked from cannon blasts. Crazy job, right? Like, you're just running back and forth with gunpowder. You're so important to what's happening, but probably don't get a lot of credit. I'm picturing this in the Ooh, same manner that you used to bust tables at Red Robin. Okay. Just sprinting around. You used to say that, like, when you were on, you would just go into, like, I'm going to bust my ass for four hours mode, and then you'd be done. No, yeah. No credit. Dirt, messy <laughs> stuff. I mean, we're, we're, sh we're showing how much times have changed when we're comparing, uh, like, the powder guy, the cannon powder guy, to the Red Robin busser. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you definitely have your good days and your bad days. You, you have your days when your timing is right. You're there when they need it. Um, everything kind of lines up for you. You have your struggles. You have your tough days. You got some guys that are being over demanding. Um, you're not getting to your spots on time. Uh, so, yeah, I feel that's very relatable for me. 
<laughs> well, what about the fact that he had to hide the powder because if a spark hits him, boom. Nuts. Can't wrap my mind around any of it, just to be completely honest. War seems so bad. <laughs> just ships firing at each other. It's a nightmare. I'm not a strong swimmer. Like, nothing in that situation is good for my current skill set. You're pretty quick and short. You could have been a good powder monkey. Okay. I, I'll give myself, like, the, the quickness and, like, the game. I see you, like, like, juking and diving guys with powder and, like, getting to the cannon. And then, here you go, sir. And then just shoving it in the cannon. Good to go, sir. And then running back below deck and then grabbing more and then dipping and diving and weaving But it's through. also, it's a cardio. It's a stamina thing. Uh, I don't have that. Uh, you're right. I mean, kind of like the fun football drills part of it would be decent at. But, like, just, I was talking, like, war in general, like... I don't know. The jokes normally don't go over well in war. Yeah, not now. Uh, you know, I have to assume I'm a terrible shot with my shaky hands. <laughs> you are probably a horrible They shot. probably would not give me a gun. <laughs> like Which then it. makes me, that makes me feel very bad at being at war Ooh. if I don't have a uh, weapon. But uh, kill ya. <laughs> Shaking yeah. your hand in their face. So that's good. Well, anyway. So James is during this battle. They're trading cannon shots. James running around. Shells exploding all around. Men screaming in pain and officers shouting to make their orders heard. The ships draw closer and closer until they collide. Americans swarmed aboard the active where sailors fought hand to hand. <laughs> James' coat was drenched in blood when the British sailors finally gave up. If I'm on a ship, right, and we're trading cannon blows... And then the ships collide, and now I got to go fight hand to hand. Like, no, I like the distance fighting. See, I don't. I prefer the hand to hand because at least once the hand to hand starts, I know the boat's not going on. If the boat is going down, I'm dead. Oh, you just don't want to be in the water. Yes. Okay. I've got. I have a better chance to survive in hand to hand combat than I do if this boat goes down. Okay. What I always find interesting, and there was this show on Showtime or Stars called Black Sails about pirates, and it's in the Caribbean, and they're doing these types of battles with cannons and stuff, and it's like gorgeous. Mm. The setting, you know, you're on the Caribbean, like blue ocean, sun. Usually when you picture war battles, I'm picturing like, you know, just grit and dirt and trees exploding and like you know trenches it's not like a scenic sight like going to war during a sunset on the ocean I don't, i'd like sir can i enjoy the sunset real quick no otherwise you die yeah that's the tough part war's a, guy, a bad time official official after a rousing welcome in philadelphia the sailors split up the money and headed back to sea but this time their luck ran out the Royal Lewis went hard after a British ship that led them into a trap. Uh, soon, the Americans were surrounded by three British warships and forced to surrender. James was in serious trouble. He had been born free in Philadelphia, but now he was a British prisoner. He knew that the British often sold black captives to British sugar plantations in the West Indies. Was he about to become a slave? Yikes. Crazy, right? It's all bad. Everything's bad. Well, the prize becoming money... a slave. Bad. The prize money they got from the first ship, that was good. That was good. That was the good part of the story. So, yeah, like, what a... This is what your mom was warning you about, but, like, what a terrible, terrible predicament. Yeah. Um, James and others were taken aboard a British ship. The British captain, John Beasley, inspected them one by one, moving his way slowly along a line of captives. He stopped when he got to James. His eyes went to a small bag James held in his mind. He asked what was in it. And James replied, your mom. Time out. Yeah. 
The ship captain went around to the people, the British ship captain. Yeah. And he said, oh, we're going to get some noodle barks here. We got literally guys out the window again. I'll show you just because it's one of the more ridiculous things I've ever seen. They're this going has, up. This hasn't happened in a while. Hasn't happened in a little while. So that's good. The right, window washers anyway. come and any dog would not like that. They're not washing the windows. They're, uh, I, don't even, I don't know what they're doing. I think they're just cruising. It's a new tour. Um, all right. So reset. So the captain of the British ship. Yeah. Comes by and he's asking, he asks him, what's in the bag in your mind or what's in the back of your mind? Oh, no, no. You heard that wrong. Okay. <laughs> that would be a weird question to ask. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> James' eyes went to a small bag James held in his hand. Okay. Yes, he was holding a bag. Gotcha. That makes a lot more sense. I Maybe uh, I read it wrong. And the captain said, what's in that bag? And he said his mother, like, ashes or something. He said, no, your mom. Oh, your mom. Was that, was that, that was just a killer joke? <laughs> yeah, it was just one of the best jokes I ever told. Okay. <laughs> no, he said, it's marbles, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you you got so confused by that whole thing. This whole so story's been pretty serious, and then yeah, one misheard <laughs> word and a your mom joke. I was like, wow, all right. I was like, is that the first your mom joke ever? Now I'm really into this. <laughs> no, it was a bag. He said marbles. It was a bag of marbles. Bag of marbles. He's sir. 14 years old. Right. The captain brightened. It so happened that his son Willie was aboard, and Willie was James's age, and Willie loved marbles. That's good news so far. So a game was quickly arranged, and the boys became friends. So he's like, go play marbles with my son. This is great. He's been bugging me all war. <laughs> I hate marbles. <laughs> I've been playing marbles in between battles nonstop with Willie. I'm so How do you glad. play marbles? Is marbles the one where you bounce it and you try to scoop up? That's jacks, I thought. There's different ways to play marbles. When I lived in Australia, this was like I played marbles every, like I think it's second grade. Like we okay. just played marbles. Marble but, fest. But we played in a way that's different than American way. So I don't know how they play. We played that like you would, this is not how they're talking about in the book. I guarantee it. We played, you would okay. drop two marbles. Like I would choose a marble I wanted from your deck. Right? right? Or your stash of marbles. Someone would choose a marble they wanted from me. We would drop them so they banked off each other uh, and spread out, you know, like atoms. Okay. Like they hit each other. Poof, and then you would take turns, and the first person to roll their marble and hit the other marble get to keep both marbles. So you could, okay. if you thought like, oh, shit, I'm wide open, you could go hide somewhere and make them come to you, then attack. If you rolled... You had to make sure you had a lot of speed, so if you missed, it didn't just it stop. Would far it away. would go far away. Right. But I did that in Australia in second or third grade. I don't know if that's how they're playing here. I would doubt it, but that's how I played. But I had, right. like, a crazy marble set, dude. I used to know, like, all the terms, like the sparkled and the cat's eye, and I would know all of the terms. Sure. Yeah, Australia, Jimmy, was big into marbles. Big marble, dude. Okay. And you'd play for keeps, which was kind of wild. Yeah, it's pretty intense for second graders. Yeah, like you'd be stealing each other's marbles. Yeah. But not stealing. You just played for keeps. Um, so James and Willie start playing. James had learned to shoot expertly from his father's friends, and though slavery might be in his future when it came to marbles, James Fortin owned Willie Beasley. Just crushed him. Nice. Captain Beasley was so impressed that he offered to take James back to England and pay for his education if he would renounce his allegiance to America. James answered without hesitation, no. Never. I was Damn. captured fighting for my country, and I will never be a traitor to her. Love it. You like that? Even it's if he's power. risking becoming a slave? He's a patriot, man. Like, that's, that's a real patriot. Yeah. 
So I mean, I wouldn't do it. I'm saying <laughs> I want that to be said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going on to live a nice British life. <laughs> With Willie. You have a new brother. Yes. Instead of shipping him to the West Indies, Captain Beasley sent James to the Jersey, which was a ship, a prison ship in the New York Harbor. It was more like a death ship. James spent seven months in an airless space below deck and nearly starved. When he was so I have more info on this on the Wikipedia page, this death ship, which I don't know why I would do it. It's pretty terrible. Thousands of men were crammed below decks. There was no natural light or fresh air and no and very few provisions for the sick and hungry. Prisoners were brutally treated, but most died due to poor sanitation and disease. As many as eight dead were buried a day on the HMS Jersey. Again, back to bad times. Yeah. Yeah. Fortin was fortunate as he was exchanged after seven months imprisonment and released on parole and his promise not to fight in the war. Like for me, that would be so easy. Like, yeah, I, I didn't plan on it because everything that just happened sucked. Yeah. So I was, was planning on not making this a possibility again. He walked from Brooklyn to Philadelphia. Jesus. <laughs> Jake, just vis- Jake just visibly tried to compute that in his head. Because, because what I don't get there is like, like we said at the top of the show, he's, he's 1% of a free black person. Like of black people in the country, 1% of them are free. How could he walk from Brooklyn to Philadelphia and not be just stopped every time he saw people and say, what are you doing, slave? You know, or yeah. like, how does a 15 year old do that? Yeah. And, uh, I used to not be, I used to enjoy, like if I had to walk somewhere, I was like, all right, this is going to be pretty nice. Like go for a 15 minute walk, grab a coffee, a sandwich, uh, something, you know, something at a gas station, whatever you need. It's like, all right. Yeah, I'll I'll do that. Dude, the scooters in the city have kind of ruined that for me. Like now now I have trouble walking like multiple blocks. I'm like, oh, this sucks. This isn't scootering. So and again, like you just said it in a sentence and it's just words. Walking from Brooklyn to Philadelphia. Yeah. We can probably find out how long that takes on Google Maps. No way, that's impossible. How how long do you think Google Maps is going to say it takes to walk from Brooklyn to Philadelphia? Like a month? I mean, it probably says like it probably says like 35 hours, but that's without like taking a break or anything. And maybe like a direct road, like how did he know how to get there? 31 hours. What did you say it was going to be? 35. Wow, that was impressive, Jake. Thanks, man. It's 92 miles. Yeah. Not uh, uh It's somewhat easy. You can follow like river. Like you can follow the the river for a while. I mean, I guess there was a main roadway, but fuck that. Good for James. Good for James. Um. Yeah, so he walked there, and basically, let's see, he said uh, he looked like a skeleton. His hair had fallen out, but he was free. Thus, James Fortin wrote later, did a game of marbles keep me from a life of West Indian servitude? I'd like to think it wasn't just the marbles. I'd like to think that the... The British guy, Beasley, saw the gumption in 14-year-old James? Oh, absolutely. James's gumption wasn't... He, it wasn't hidden. It's, the, uh, it's like when you hear people talk about... Again, I link everything to sports, but I'm picturing like the NFL draft, and they're just like, you meet this kid, he's a special kid. Like That's what he was saying when he met, when he met James. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Um, so the other son was 12. 
Willie. This is interesting. Willie. I found another source here. James was a master of the marbles and often succeeded in displacing all the marbles. And then, wow, yeah, so uh, so what do you think he did in his afterlife, Jake? Do you have any guesses what James Fortin became? James Fortin, after the experience we just heard. I don't know. I got nothing. What, what do you do? <laughs> There's a poet poem written about the uh, ship that they were all stuck on, but I don't want to. I don't want to sing it. Okay. So James Fortune, he grew up to be a wealthy and well-known sailmaker, and an outspoken opponent of slavery. He hired both blacks and whites at his Philadelphia sailmaking business. He strongly supported women's rights. Respected by all, he was offered the chance to become president of Liberia in Africa, but chose to remain in America. I mean, no disrespect to James, but how are they choosing presidents in Liberia? Just open invite? It's a completely fair question. What was the process? How about that like, sail maker in Philadelphia? Was America just booming so much at this point? Like we just took down Britain that like Liberia was like, yo, we got to get in the action. Let's get a strong African-American leader. But even even if that was the conversation that happened, which would be nuts, how did they still find our guy? I don't know. I mean, he must have been really, really active in the causes. Yeah, yeah, I'm guessing that's getting underplayed a little bit because if, if he was just a kid that played some marbles and made sales, we're probably not talking about him today. Yeah, that's true. He had a bunch of kids, married twice, first wife died, that's sad, and had another wife with a bunch of kids. He wrote a pamphlet called Letters from a Man of Color and published it anonymously. It's interesting. So he went on to do like a lot of good, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool, and it's, I, I mean, uh, I don't know if it's a sad thing or, or what you'd call it, but, uh, I mean, you hear him, <laughs> like, hiring white people, black people, <laughs> being a women's activist. It's like, okay, again, kind of where we started, if we're going so full circle on this episode, how this was, you know, 200-plus years ago, and this guy was, like, addressing modern issues back then, like, Hitting him right in the mouth. Uh, yeah. He died on March 4th, that's Krause's birthday, 1842, at the age of 75 in Philadelphia. Thousands of people, both black and white, attended his funeral. Wow. Okay, so he started um, a movement to have black people move to Liberia. Liberia. Okay. Um, saying, like, you'll be have a better life there. Move, go. So that was the connect the dot we were yeah. missing. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, my takeaway is that war and slavery are terrible. But yeah. sh- but that that my favorite scene from this story is like the powder monkey rolling wars. It's wild. Like all this is going on and you're just running up and down. Yeah, and I guess you, you and I, we, we talked before this again, bringing the curtain back. We wanted to start movie-fying things again because we had a lot of fun doing that. In season one, yeah. But here's the and, thing, Jake. This is kind of a movie. Like, what are we what are I mean, changing? it already is. that That's the problem. And, like, normally we like naming actors and stuff, but, I mean, it would just be, like, a young, powerful black actor and, like, a, a, <laughs> a powerful older black actor. Um, but I was going to say in that powder scene, what I, what would be my writer edition would be, uh, like there's, there's the one, there's the one mean, awful white guy that's just like awful to him and he ends up like saving his life or something like that. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. So you'd have to, at the beginning of the movie, you'd have to have a shot up. Like, the movie would open up with a ship coming into harbor. This would be the opening scene. A ship okay. coming into harbor with the whole crowd cheering, right? Yes. Like, we got him, we got him, we got him. And 12-year-old James watching 
from a distance. Like you, they show him watch kind of like Game of Thrones season one when you see Arya watching the king. Yeah, arrive. like e- everyone mobs up, but yeah. James keeps his distance. And then you see like, oh, he loves this. And then you have to have, and then you have to cut to him in his house playing marbles with his dad. Right, like that's what they do. So now we know he plays marbles. Yeah, instead of mobbing it, he goes back, plays with dad. Yeah. yeah. And then you have, like, the second act would be his enlistment in the army. Right. And the whole scene of him being a powder monkey and just being so good at his job and all that. And then they, they capture a ship and he wins the spoils, right? And he right. gets the awards and he sees mom and she's like, that's enough now. Come home. Blah, blah. And he's like, no, I have to fight for my country. Like, I just got rich, mom. Like, I just gave you all this money. He's like, I have to go back. So he goes back. Then he becomes... Then he... Uh, then the whole next battle where they lose the marble scene and then the, then the slate, then the being on the ship where you're getting tortured. Like, I don't know how you even do that. Yeah. This has a movie. This is a movie. We don't need to change much. This is a movie. Um, you make one scene where someone like the sail fails and someone's like, man, if we just, if we had sails that were easier to pull up. Oh and yeah, and that's how he goes into the sales business. Yeah, sales, yeah. sales, sales, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the sale. I'm in sales. I'm oh, in what, sales. What do you sales. sell? Sales. <laughs> sales, sales. You just repeat everything. No, I sell sales. I sell sales by the seashore. Um. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you and have- the other that that would be kind of that would be like the fun like Forrest Gump like twist there and. Like, again, I, I like my movies. I think you can make a powerful movie with a little bit of humor in it. You know, obviously that the British captain comes up and he's this mean, mean MFer, walks up to him, stares him down. What do you got in, the, in that bag? Your mom. Marbles. Marbles, sir. And the captain goes, <laughs> marbles? <laughs> my son loves marbles. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'd leave out. I'd I'd make it just on fourteen year old James and have like the end, the end montage just showing everything he did wonderful later on. Yeah, that would be another movie if you wanted to show right. his other efforts. But it's a movie. It's there. Fourteen year old James Fortin, way better than me at stuff. Although I think the bravery would have to be in question. But I think I, Ooh. at 14 years old, I don't think I was brave enough. No. But I think I could have had a lot of fun being a powder monkey. Yeah, I kind of see what you're saying. Um, I get that. You can be competitive about it and, you know, speed over here, speed over there. Um, I was more thinking along the line of marbles still. Like, if if marbles was your jam, no video games, no baseball, no other real sports. It was like, we play marbles. Whew. We would have some heated marble matches. Yeah. Throughout the town. We'd be known as the marble idiots. How many people do you think challenged James to a game of marbles after hearing the tale? So many. He was like, oh, that was just a hobby I had for like one year. So I don't really play anymore. Yeah, he hates marbles. Like, what? We've been calling you the Marble Kid. That's a good nickname. <laughs> the Marble Kid? The Marble Kid. Kid Marbles. Kid Marbles. Wow, that is a good nickname. Nice. I well, call- the guy that, a guy that got offered a president job, we're, give, we're happy we're giving him the name Kid Marbles. <laughs> I might take it for myself. I played marbles as a kid. Okay, Kid Marbles. Nice. Thank, so that- thanks for listening to Laughs from the Past with me. Jake's story and Kid Marbles. Yeah. Thank you very much. We will be back next week with another uh, tale of a a child doing something way better than uh, you, Jake, or I have ever done. So see you then. Rate, subscribe, review, listen to every old episode that we ever have. There's, uh, like I said, almost 50 of them. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Oh, that's like an insult now, Jake. What is See you next Tuesday. That's how people oh, yeah. spell out that word. I didn't Yikes. mean it. I didn't mean it like that. I just meant you will hear from us again 
on next Tuesday. My bad. See ya.